Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Claire. I'm a contract librarian on assignment here with NOAA Central Library. This seminar series is offered through the NOAA Central Library Seminar Program, which provides an educational forum for the presentation of ideas, research updates, and news in support of NOAA's mission. Before I start, I have a few technical tips for attendees. Just so you are aware, you are muted and you are not able to unmute. However, if you have a question, you can type it into the question panel and we will get to those during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If you're having any audio or visual issues, if you can't hear the speaker or see the slides, please try logging off and back on and that will solve most issues in GoToWebinar. And just as a reminder, this is being recorded. If you would like to revisit this seminar or view previous seminars, you can find them on our YouTube channel. Now I'm going to turn it over to Peg, who's gonna introduce the speaker today. Thank you, Claire. Thank you so much. Greetings, everyone. This is Peg Brady from NOAA Fisheries. Welcome to the 2022 EBM, EBFM seminar series. Today, we're continuing the series that was initiated back in November 2017. And our main objective has been to increase awareness regarding ecosystem-based management, particularly fisheries management, and highlight the progress that NOAA and our partners are making to implement EBM nationwide and to better understand marine ecosystems. The NOAA Library continues to be our co-host, and the seminars are held the second Wednesday of each month between 3 and 4 Eastern time. And uh, as Claire had suggested, the, uh, the, the presentation is publicly accessible afterwards. It's recorded and archived. And uh, it's certainly, uh, we'll put the, uh, the link to that in our chat uh, for the archives. Following today's presentation, there will be opportunity to ask questions. And uh, please put those in the question, and Claire will happily uh, present those questions to our speaker today. I want to thank many of our speakers in the past and all those uh, attendees that have joined us each, each and every month. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to share information about our next speaker, which is on March 9th. Andrew Lipsky from our Northeast Fisheries Science Center will be talking about uh, renewable energy development here in the Northeast. So uh, today we're very fortunate to have Kara Meckley, who is the Chief of the Habitat Protection Division within the Office of Habitat Conservation. I'm very pleased uh, to have Kara. She's been a, a, a member of our EBM le leadership team, and uh, she will be uh, focusing in today on the, a fish production calculator for salt marsh and seagrass habitats. So please join me in welcoming Kara. Thank you so much, Kara. Thank you. Hi, everybody. First, a big thank you to Peg and Claire for their organization of this uh, EBFM webinar series. I never miss it and I'm happy to be able to present to you all today. Um, here's the plan for our presentation today. I'm gonna to give you a bit of context for why we pursued this project's data analysis and development of the online tool. Uh, I wanna to also provide you with an overview of the methods and the anticipated application uh, of its results. And then I also am looking forward to demoing the tool for you, although I will fully admit I was worried about having bandwidth issues. And so um, I'm going to demo it for you with a series of screenshots, but you can just pretend that it's live. Um, I also don't want to wait till the end uh, of the presentation to highlight our wonderful partners in this exciting project. The Nature Conservancy has been um, an amazing partner, um, as well as the Northeastern University and the University of Edinburgh and I very much appreciate their leadership. We also had a number of collaborators, including USGS, the Dauphin Island Sea Lab, and Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission throughout the project. And some follow-on work as a phase two is being made possible by the LenFest Ocean Program, and so I wanna recognize them as well. Thank you so much. Um, right up front here, I wanna be clear about the goal of this project and the tool. It is to quantify the fin fish and mobile invert enhancement from the declining nursery habitats of seagrass, salt marsh, and oyster reefs. And we're gonna talk about what enhancement means in this context a bit later. We fully recognize there are other factors that influence fish productivity in a given location. And that with this project, we are isolating structured habitat as the variable. So why did we pursue this project? Uh, habitat is an integral part of NOAA's mission, and it'll become even more integral in the future with climate change realities. And we need to continue to develop the science 
and tools to quantify and communicate the ecosystem services that are provided by these habitats that our managed fisheries and also our protected species rely on. More specifically, here in OHC, we were continuing to hear the challenges of quantitatively linking inshore habitat availability with fish productivity, both inshore and offshore. And we were also getting formidable leadership questions like how much is enough with regard to habitat conservation? Like how much habitat do we need to protect? And the corollary, how much habitat do we need to restore in order to increase fish productivity by a known amount? And there have been some great pilot studies to look at that inshore offshore connection. And we wanted to build on that state of knowledge and, and most importantly, make it very accessible, quickly accessible for management consideration. Uh, we inherently know that fish need specific habitats to meet their various life stage requirements for all you essential fish habitat fans out there. But why do we need to quantify that relationship? Well, there, we had a couple of things in mind in pursuing this multi-year project. One was to better link eco ecosystems to economies by maximizing all the habitat data that's currently available. We wanted to give fishery management councils some synthesized data products to help inform their decisions about habitat conservation measures and fisheries management. We also wanted to be able to help support our NOAA fisheries colleagues in the EFH consultation process including early coordination um, with action agencies as they consider different alternatives and projects. And we wanted to cultivate stronger partnerships for habitat conservation. And last but not least, in case Jason Link is listening, we wanted to make progress implementing the NOAA EBFM policy and roadmap. So how did we get here? Uh, the Restoration Center in OHC invested in TNC's development of an oyster valuation tool about 10 years ago, and that was prompted by several experts published papers on the value of oyster habitat for fish productivity. So the oyster tool, and you can see a little screenshot of that landing page on the right, is available on TNC's Mapping Ocean Wealth website. Um, this tool looks at two ecosystem services that are provided by oyster restoration, water filtration, and fish production. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, this got our wheels turning in the Habitat Protection Division. We were thinking about how this kind of analysis might be applied to protection questions uh, and to other types of habitats beyond oyster reefs. Um, we know there's a wealth of habitat data in the nearshore environment, but it wasn't compiled in a consistent way such that we could draw a quantitative conclusion about the value of those habitats for fish productivity. So, um, my division uh, initiated a multi-year project with TNC in about the 2015-2016 timeframe to look at salt marsh seagrass and oysters with a focus on productivity. We held a workshop in 2017 to talk about the project's goals and products and the potential utility to end users and different types and sectors of end users. And we were able to gather feedback from representatives from across NOAA's line offices um, the councils, interstate fishery commissions, state agencies, and other NGOs. So we were really thrilled to have such a productive um, workshop all those years ago. So digging into our methodology, the underlying assumption here is that salt marsh seagrass and oyster habitats are limiting. It's well known that each of these habitats current extent is far less than historic levels. So then the assumption at the beginning of the curve here is that more habitat means more fish. The analysis does recognize that productivity maxes out at some point and it doesn't keep increasing unchecked. The total enhancement results assume that number one, the habitat is mature. Um, number two, you have all of the species life stages on that habitat so that there is recruitment to adulthood. So as old ones die out, new ones enter. So this enhancement number should be static or relatively static from year to year in a mature habitat. And the results are essentially a snapshot of each year when we've maxed out that curve sort of at the, at the right end of the x-axis here. So continuing with the research methodology, the value of this work and the most uh, significant chunk of effort was spent cleaning and filtering all the available nectin and benthic macroinvertebrate sampling both on and off structured habitat. 
So first, we collected as many data points as possible through a literature review and gathered fisheries independent monitoring data from states. And all that went into a big database. And it's important to note that we used salt marsh edge um, as our parameter, so versus all salt marsh acreage. And that edge is defined as the first one meter of open water and the first two meters of vegetation along the shoreline of any natural Spartina marshes. And then seagrass habitats primarily included Halidouli and Thalassia dominated beds. So then came the most intensive effort of the project to clean the data. Robust rules ensured that the studies that were included were actually representative of juvenile enhancement from that structured habitat. And those rules included studies that had a paired sample, so both on and off the habitat, structured habitat. It looked at fissure and vertebrate density, and the study was only included if the capture technique has a high catch efficiency for young of year. Um, we assumed a conservative 100% catch efficiency, but only for, the, for species where that particular gear is known to be effective at catching that species juveniles. So to give an example, we did not include blue crab that were caught in uh, a seine because of its poor catch efficiency and bias towards capturing larger adults. So also to make sure we were not pseudo replicating in the same location, we employed a pooled data approach by using a, a bay as the sampling unit. So that means we summarized sampling and replicates within each bay in the eco region being the Gulf of Mexico. So therefore, every season and year in an individual bay is represented by one data point for calculating the mean and the standard error. And that was done per species, per habitat. And so this was often an amalgamation of several studies or sampling events to arrive at that particular quote bay unit. After cleaning comes data filtering. This same rules-based approach was used to ensure that the species that are included are consistently enhanced by salt marsh seagrass and oyster habitat in each ecoregion. The species must meet these three rules to be enhanced that you see on the screen now. One, the species has an overall higher density on the structured versus unstructured habitat, meaning the overall mean is positive. The species is more abundant on structured habitat in at least 50% of those studies and the species is present in more than one bay in that ecoregion, which helped us remove individual study bias and get a bit of a broader geographic range. Now I've mentioned ecoregions a few times so far, and I wanted to clarify that we did look at data nationwide and the Northern Gulf of Mexico was the most data rich. Um, we also have enough data to do a seagrass analysis in the South Atlantic, but we haven't gotten that paper fully developed yet. It's actively being worked on. Um, this was a little surprising to me, I'll say, that so few geographies had data that fit the rules for inclusion in this analysis. And it, it really leads me to do some thinking about how we can use our internal, internally directed research or our grant directed dollars for science to get some more data that can allow the tool to encompass you know, more areas of the country. So back to the rules. They're all to make sure that the data going into the analysis is producing a very conservative estimate of enhancement. We wanted to only be reporting the results when we were sure that the species are enhanced by one of those habitat types. So the researchers also did a gut check with a literature review and some expert inquiry by asking others if that species meets all those rules, do we expect that species to use structured habitat based on their life history? And from these filtered data, we know which species are enhanced and by how much, meaning how many additional juveniles are in that unit of habitat over and above that of sand or mud. And one caveat is that we did not look at how salt marsh, seagrass, and oysters may function together in a place, how they might have some co-reliance on um, those habitats or how they may actually duplicate function in a given place. And so here's our full process. We've, we've now, um, I think you can see my cursor. So now we've identified quantified studies, we've cleaned and filtered the data to arrive at consistently enhanced species. And then next the team determined the density by size class of species on structured habitat versus an unvegetated control. 
And then to estimate production enhancement, we applied a standard size dependent growth and mortality model. So we could grow up these young fish and kill them off as adults via natural mortality. And then that then calculates the adult production from that juvenile enhancement on structured habitat. So specifically that um, is reported back as biomass per unit per year. And then lastly, is the uncertainty. And so we calculated um, uncertainty in the estimates of enhanced density by modeling all of the density data as a normal distribution. And then if a negative value was drawn from that normal distribution, the density value was set to zero because we, we don't actually think that the presence of a habitat leads to a decrease in fish abundance. So that was set to zero. Those estimates of enhanced productivity and uncertainty were calculated by drawing 10,000 independent samples at random from that modeled normal distribution for each enhanced species. And from there, the mean and standard deviation and lower and upper quartiles of the data of the distribution of productivity enhancements could be calculated um, both for all species combined as well as for each species individually. And we recognize that there are other life history factors that play a role in production, but due to a lack of scientific knowledge on the variability of those factors, all of those other parameters in life history were assumed to be constant. And then lastly, on this slide, I'll note that the team applied one sort of quote enhancement value by ecoregion. So in the Northern Gulf of Mexico, for example, all salt marsh is treated equally in terms of its fish production capacity for the purposes of this analysis. So this notion of a healthy um, salt marsh versus a degraded or lower functioning salt marsh and how that affects fish pr productivity is not something we addressed in this phase one, but it is something that we are exploring as part of phase two. So how much data did we gather and use? This map shows the number of data sets that went into the analysis for each habitat. And these numbers within the shapes are probably tough to read on the screen, but the circles, for example, are for seagrass. And those numbers go as high as 18 independent sampling units um, in some locations. So again, these represent data that have been combined both spatially, so within a particular bay and temporarily, such as between different sampling events to avoid pseudo replication. And the actual number of times someone sampled, such as through a net, is way up in the thousands. And here are the results for the Gulf. Um, this is for the full ecoregion. So this table is showing you um, the number of species that were sampled. Um, of those sampled species, the numbers that the number of species that were enhanced, so they followed all those filtering rules that I mentioned earlier. Um, the number of species that were data deficient, um, there were not enough studies to include them in, in the analysis. And the number of species that had enough data, but they didn't meet those filtering rules, and so we determined they were not enhanced by the presence of that structured habitat. habitat. In every case with enough data, the majority of species were enhanced. Um, however, it's notable that there were plenty of species without sufficient data, and I'm gonna show you an example of that in a couple of slides. Um, this data analysis, we feel, is pretty valuable all on its own, um, but we wanted to make it more accessible. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at the tool. So this is the landing page. When you go to the Mapping Ocean Wealth, website. The link is up here at the top of the screen, and I have it on some later slides as well. Um, on the landing page, you can find links to the published Gulf of Mexico paper down here, um, as well as some earlier foundational publications. We have a fact sheet, we have an FAQ, and probably most importantly here, you can download the data and the metadata right from this page if you like, and do your own um, analysis and work with that data. To interact with the tool itself, um, you will click Estimate Habitat. At this point, you have two options. Um, you can draw a study area on the map, or you can use this Enter Directly, where it says Best for Small Areas. You can enter the acreage of salt marsh or seagrass area directly into the system to get fish production values. So, 
If this is your selection, then you don't use the map. That's just a set of screens with questions. And this option might be most helpful if you're interested in this ecoregion as a whole and you want to know how much um, restoration acreage may generate more of a specific species. But if you want to estimate how much habitat and fish production is in a specific location within the northern gulf, it's best to use this draw study area option to explore that. So we're going to dig in a little deeper there. You'll notice that the draw study area button is uh, it's grayed out. And that's because you'll need to zoom in and pan around on the map to get close enough to your area of interest in order to actually draw a, a polygon. So I'm zooming into Pensacola, Florida, and you'll see that this scale is still too large to draw an area, so we're going to get closer. Now we're close enough to draw a study area. I can now select the box, and I have done that here. I've drawn an area that encompasses most of the northern Pensacola Bay. Once you um, draw that polygon and double click on that, you will be shown this screen that will show you the total acres of your polygon. In this case, it's a little over 116,000 acres within that Gulf of Mexico region. It'll also tell you the acres of seagrass habitat, which is 365, and it'll tell you the acres of salt marsh edge habitat, which is 133. Um, from here, to get to the fish data, you'll need to select these um, bottom options to select the fish species that you want to know more about. So you're gonna click on either seagrass or salt marsh edge fish, and we're gonna go with salt marsh fish first. Um, so on this screen, you'll get this long list of fish species, and you can be selective down this left side and choose just a few species of interest that you know are found in this area, and this is what we recommend in using the, the tool. Or you can do what I did and select all of them so that I can show you the total results. Um, I wanna make a key caveat here is that when applying these estimates to a particular location within each region, minor adjustments really should be made to those estimates to reflect your knowledge of the site. So for example, a fish may be enhanced somewhere across the Gulf of Mexico region, but it may be absent or rare within your particular bay. Um, and so overall estimates of enhancement should then be modified to reflect this local knowledge. So you also may be looking for a particular species and you may not see it here in this list to select. And that, that might lead you to say even perhaps out loud, hey, wait a minute, where's my fish? So if you click on the where's my fish button, it will take you to this table. This pop-up message will explain that the available data didn't always show the enhancement by that habitat type or the data may have been deficient. So this table includes a list of all the species. It, it keeps on going down and down here. It includes all the species that were considered for each habitat type. And then the outputs that you see on this tool only include those species that had both enough data and were enhanced by that habitat. So these species are labeled as enhanced in the table, obviously. The table also shows the reason why a species wasn't included, if in fact that was the case. So that could have been because the fish is not enhanced by the habitat. So you'll see not enhanced um, under, say, seagrass status for lined sole, or the fish may not be, may or may not be enhanced, but we didn't have enough data. Um, it was either data deficient or we had no data at all in order to determine whether or not it was enhanced by the hab by that habitat. So. Um, I could only show you a screenshot, but there's a full 40, 40 some species, 46 or so species in this table. And, you know, the significant number of data deficient species leads us to suspect that this analysis and this online tool is really underestimating fish productivity. And we think these numbers are pretty impressive to begin with. Um, but just to think that there's still more data, hopefully, that we could collect could um, enhance these. Uh, numbers even more. So let's go back to our results for Pensacola Bay. Um, these are the results when I selected all those species for um, salt marsh edge. So you can see I have the salt marsh ed edge tab. And the top line result for total fish and invert productivity for this area of 133 acres of salt marsh edge 
is over 35 million new individual young of year fish. That's across all species. Um, are added to the system annually. Plus, over 1.4 million pounds of fish and invertebrate biomass is added to the system each year by the presence of this habitat in this location. So there is also a breakdown of productivity by species, and that's all found in this list, and you can, in the tool, scroll down and see all the, all the species. So there's another way to look at these results. Check my time here. Okay, good. Um, there's another way to look at these results. TNC had made this great infographic for a previous presentation when we were earlier in the development of the tool. So I'm gonna borrow it here because I really like the pictures and the summary information. So for those 133 acres or about 100 football fields of salt marsh edge habitat, we identified that the populations of at least 16 different species are enhanced as a result of this habitat. And again, the habitat produces an estimated 1.4 million pounds of fish and invertebrates each year. And of that, approximately 1.1 million pounds or 84% of that total production are commercially or recreationally important species, such as um, those you see listed on the right, um, various species of shrimp, southern flounder, blue crab, um, spotted sea trout. And then just to quickly pop back and select the seagrass result tab here, um, I wanted to show you the results for all the species selected um, for the seagrass. And uh, it wasn't shown on that previous infographic, that was just for salt marsh edge. So for seagrass, um, clicking on the results tab for that, you get over 43 million individual new young of year fish per year. Um, as well as nearly 4.5 million additional pounds of production um, each year, again, across all species. So how can we look at this data through both a habitat protection lens and a habitat restoration lens? Um, we can now better articulate which species of fish and how much of them stand to be lost if we're evaluating a project that will damage or eliminate this habitat in Pensacola Bay. Um, we can also consider what would be gained by adding habitat acreage through, through restoration and using that um, quote and uh, enter directly option from that landing page that I mentioned. Um, you can get estimates of the productivity gained in total or also as a breakdown um, by species. Um, and then, so as a result of the workshop we had and refined over time, you know, we, we began to think about who, who do we envision can make use of this information and any future iterations of the tool if we're able to fill critical data gaps for other parts of the country or other habitat types. And for this, we thought through, you know, what the data tells us, what could be accomplished um, or informed with that data, and, and who's the one who would do that. Um, this includes those that span habitat protection and restoration work as, as well as informing fishery management decisions. And, and again, the value of this work lies, you know, not just in the data compilation, cleaning and synthesis, which, you know, this is the first of its kind in this kind of data set, but also into a product that can be readily and quickly retrieved. So um, some examples under this um, green protection uh, umbrella, Supporting EFH consultation process, as I mentioned earlier, this could be used as an outreach tool with action agencies informing compensatory mitigation and helping us prioritize which proposed actions to consult on based on the potential habitat loss and based on the potential impact to fisheries. Um, within this second column in the restoration realm, this data can help inform and quantify what's gained by restoration of these habitats and with species specific information, we can also link to and directly support fishery management goals, um, which is really important. And then speaking of fisheries management, this data, um, it provides evidence, not that, we, not that we didn't already know that habitat was important, but, but this provides quantitative evidence for finding ways to incorporate habitat into stock assessments and rebuilding plans. And, and it can also help inform which proposed federal projects the councils may want to exercise their Magnus and Stevens Act authority to weigh in on those EFH consultations. 
So what comes next? Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have our Gulf of Mexico paper. The link is um, here on this slide, as well as on that landing page for the online tool. It was published this past April. Uh, the seagrass paper is currently in development. Um, I'll also say, going back to this, uh, we launched the tool in July during NOAA Fisheries Habitat Month, which was really exciting. And it's hard to get on this schedule for this popular seminar series. So if you have something coming up in six months, get on the schedule. Um, unfortunately, there was not enough data for analysis in other regions. Um, and that, that leads me to think about how we can encourage more data collection. The biggest limitation for this analysis nationwide was the lack of an unvegetated control um, in both published and unpublished data. Um, I'm super excited to share that there's further research underway as a phase two uh, that expands this analysis to include the effects of habitat quality, uh, as well as environmental parameters on juvenile fish production and coastal habitats. And this work is made possible with an additional investment from the LENFEST Ocean Program. And you'll see in these quick tables, um, the additional factors and parameters that are being um, investigated. So we're looking at a lot of oceanographic um, uh, properties, as well as um, some of the factors that would lead us to see whether uh, a salt marsh edge habitat or a seagrass bed is healthy, less healthy. What does that mean for fish? And also looked at uh, one of the other things, oh, it is listed here, um, a restored habitat versus a natural habitat. That's an important question too for all the dollars that we're investing in restoration is do we get as much fish from those restored versus natural habitats? And so spoiler alert, the early results are yes, it is the same fish production. So that's great news. Um, so keep an eye out for that next phase of results. I really look forward to coming back and, and sharing that with you. Um, moving forward, I also think about how we can build on this work and, and even contemplate what can we do with this, um, including even monetizing the presence of these habitats for their fisheries production values at, at a very coarse, you know, sort of high level is along the lines of X amount of habitat produces Y biomass or recruitment to the fishery. And here's the price per pound, you know, that the fishing economy gains by the presence of this habitat. It, it allows, it's, it's a great outreach tool and a great way to communicate um, the importance of these habitats. And that's just one ecosystem service from these habitats. There are so many more from carbon sequestration and denitrification to coastal community protection. The list goes on and on. And um, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot to be done here. So I wanted to quickly just give another shout out to our partners in this project, uh, many of which are also engaged in the phase two work that I just mentioned. And with that, I uh, here's my contact information as well as the link to the tool once again. I think Claire's gonna drop that into the chat if she hasn't already. And I am happy to take your questions. Sure, so we do have questions here. Give me just a moment to pull those up for you. All right, the first question, is there shoreline habitat that is not included in your three selected categories? If so, how common and how valuable is it? Are there considerations to include it in phase two? Um, is the question about a different habitat type or just um, more seagrass in places where, like on that map that showed the the different data sets, there were some gaps along the coastline where there aren't data sets. Is that is that the question? So they added, for example, in Puget Sound, there are sandy beaches. Um, yes, so um, for the purpose of this analysis, we didn't consider sandy sand to be a structured habitat. So sand and mud was considered an unvegetated control. Um, and I will say that as part of the phase two work, we are looking at more data around the country and looking at, um, I don't wanna speak out of my um, abilities here, but I know that we are looking at some data that is, doesn't have a paired unvegetated control, like thinking about the methodology and how we could use it without that control. But 
I'm going to really misspeak if I try to go farther than that. But I'm I'm excited that the phase two is able to look at more data across the country. All right, is the data available in a form for projects to now predict future salt marsh condition and a pro and proximity and then use this to assess fishery value? So the entire data set, um, the data is available. The data and the metadata is available on the landing page of the tool. You can also download, once you draw a polygon and you select your fish and you get those results, you can also export that data right out into an Excel sheet. So you can work with it from there. Um, in terms of a changing climate and where habitats may be moving, disappearing, and then you know regrowing, um, there's it would be very interesting to do that analysis on some time frame that allows us to compare where habitats have migrated based on climate change. So that's that's an interesting question. Have to think about that one. Okay. Has this tool been used by NIMPS management to adjust their rules? And if not, how has it been used? To address their rules. Um, not quite sure what's meant to by rules. Adjust. Let me um, send you the question in the chat just a second. Where do I see the chat? Oh, there it is. Has this tool been used by NIMS management to adjust their rules? Um, I'm I'm wondering the context of the word rules here. Um, are they talking about um, fishing regulations, like the the amount and how many yes. how many yes. fish you get to catch and who gets to catch them that kind of yes thing? they clarified um total okay. allowable catch okay i it has not been used for that purpose yet um and as we continue to share this tool through this webinar and others you know i'm, I'm excited to see how um the councils and others can use this information to help provide another lens it, it you know it, it provide another um, way of looking at the ecosystem situation and how that might affect catch and um, and those kind of decisions that we need to make each year, but is not currently being used for that purpose. Okay, um, what was the cost of development so far? Oh, um, well, it was not cheap. Um, so <laughs> I would say, it's uh, more than 500,000, but less than a million. Um, and I would say that, that the biggest challenge here is, is that data cleaning and filtering effort takes a lot of time and attention. And so this was a five-year project, four to five-year project. And, um, and then developing the online tool on the back end also then requires a different set of skills. So it was not cheap. But the goal here is that now we have the structure in place in this analysis and that with um, updated data, we could run the modeling, you know, again, and it would be cheaper to, to update. Are there plans to incorporate additional habitat types like mangroves in the next phase? Mm, that would be exciting. Um, we have not talked about that. One of the challenges, you might have been wondering why the oyster data is not part of the online tool. You can only pick um, for seagrass and salt marsh. And so I just wanted to share one of the challenges with oyster habitat is that we wanted to use existing spatial data and we don't have the kind of extensive spatial data of oyster habitats that we have for salt marsh and seagrass. So that would be a question that I would have for mangroves is if we have um, that kind of spatial data available that would be comparable to other structured habitat types. But that's a really, that's an interesting one. I, I want to um, follow up on that. Okay, and we have another question about habitat type. Will the second phase include natural rocky habitats? 
There are, aren't any plans to include natural rocky habitat right now that I'm aware of. All right, and um, next question, are invasive species also in the data or was it just native species? It is just native species to my understanding. Um, seagrass, I do recall, we focused on Halliduli and Thalassia beds, although, although there were some, there was some Rupia species also included, but we we didn't uh, we didn't include data on that. So that also is an interesting question. I know there are some non-native seagrass species that that provide fish habitat and help um, with productivity. So that is an interesting question as well. But I believe it was just native habitats. Okay, and one last question about habitat type. Um, we had a question about mangroves and rocky um, habitats. Um, any application for coral reefs in the works? Hmm. Not for this particular tool, but there is, you know, ongoing fish surveys that are done for shallow coral reef um, habitats in the southeast and in the Atlantic Caribbean and also in the Pacific Island Basin. So I think there are ways we can infuse that data, um, but not necessarily with a tool like this. All right. And Claire, um, Claire this is Peg. I had one mm -hmm. question for Kara. Yeah, yeah I, just uh, looking ahead, Kara, uh, wondered if um, and now we're dealing with, you know, relatively short term, this has been out and about, but I'm wondering if there's been conversations with, for instance, Fish and Wildlife or the NEARS program, or I'm thinking also the Long-Term Ecological Research Network, who would have a fair amount of data already about their systems that they've been focusing in on some time, for some time. And I'm wondering if they might be good uh, areas to apply this tool yeah, I would think so too. Um, I'd love to connect about who the right folks might be to, to talk to about that. Um, we would love to do more outreach and um, get feedback on it and potentially, you know, add data to the system. Great, because I, I could um, connect you with some folks at the LTR system. That'd be great. Yeah. All right, so the next question. Um, how else has management used this tool? So we have been aware that um, at the state level, um, as well as uh, local Bay partnerships um, have used the data to consider different project sites. Um, we've had conversations about how you might be able to use this data um, or tool in terms of early coordination with other federal action agencies that are considering a project, this kind of information might be really helpful in letting those agencies know the kind of fisheries impacts that might be um, levied by a project that continues as planned, or you might be able to talk about alternatives to a particular project to not damage certain habitat areas. So, I think that the full sort of list of how this tool is being used is not yet known um, since it is fresh out, but I am hoping that with this reminder of its availability, um, I'd love to find a way that I could get some feedback um, and welcome anyone to reach out to me to say, hey, you know, I took a look at your tool and it was helpful for this reason, or boy, you know, here's what would make it more useful for me in my work, that kind of thing. I'd, be all ears. Okay, um, next question. And just for attendees, just a reminder, you can put any questions you have in the questions panel. We'll get to as many as we can. If there are any that we don't get to, those will be emailed to the presenter. Um, the next question here is, has there been retrospective analyses done to verify the utility of this tool that estimates select species productivity following marsh, seagrass, or oyster loss or gain. And I'll put that in the chat for you so you can read it. Yeah, um, I don't believe so. 
But that is an excellent question, and I, I would love to follow up on that. I do not think we have done a retrospective, but that would be, it would really depend on the available data um, if we could run this kind of analysis um, retrospectively. But it's a great question. I'll, I'll definitely follow up with the smarter people who developed this. All right. Um, did your species list include migratory species? Um, I don't know. I would invite the person who asked to take a look at that where's my fish list um, and scroll through that full list of sort of 46 or so species um, to, to see if there's any migratory species in that, in that list. I wouldn't know offhand. All right, and um, is this tool mostly in state waters? Yes, yes it is. Okay, I think that we got to everything. I am going to wait a minute to see if there are any other questions. Attendees, if you wanna add those to the questions panel, we'll wait a little bit. Peg, if you had anything else you wanted to add? Oh, thanks, Claire. No, I'm all set. That's good. I appreciate it. And, and Kara, uh, Kara, thanks. That was an excellent presentation. I'm sure this, there'll be a lot of follow-up on this one. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Okay, great. Then um, if there aren't any other questions, um, we can wrap up a little bit early. Um, thank you to our speaker. Thank you for joining us. You'll be able to find this presentation on YouTube within the next day or so. When the presentation ends, you'll see a survey. If you could take time to fill this out, we do use those surveys to improve marketing our library seminar service and to inf inform future seminar topics. Thank you all again for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Thank you, Pam. everyone.